It's the Eagle Community Television Forum with your host, Gary Shorman. Hi, everyone. I'm Gary Shorman, and this is a special edition of our forum program. We have a guest that's joining us from the history of Kansas. And I say the history of Kansas. She's a granddaughter of former President Dwight David Eisenhower, who grew up in Abilene. Her name is Mary Jean Eisenhower. And Mary Jean, good to have you here. Thank you. It's great to be here. You know what? One of the things when you talk about I grew up about 30 miles from Abilene. So oh. we had to spend a lot of time in school back and forth between the Eisenhower Museum. And that's one of the reasons you're here. But before we go into that, what was it like to be a granddaughter of the President of the United States? Well, um, frankly, I didn't know the difference, but uh, I think that's one of the many things I loved about my grandfather. I knew that um, he was living in a very fancy house, and I knew that it may or may not be theirs. I wasn't really sure, but... Um, Maybe a rental kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> and a project, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, um, and he, you know, he would come home from the office, and they always referred to the office, but, you know, it didn't dawn on me until I got into school that it was the Oval Office that they were talking about. But when he would come home, he was just granddad. I mean, he, he was never preoccupied. He didn't, you know, we were the only things on the planet as far as he was concerned, uh, or at least the way he treated us. And so he was just a knee-slapping grandfather, and that was like one of the best things about him. Well, he was a wonderful president, served two terms, and really uh, they were very prosperous terms, and he had some very, very unique things that he started that were part of our country and still part of our country today. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. When, when he, you were growing up, at what point did you say, hey, this is pretty cool because there's media around, not like it is today, but there was still media around and all of a sudden you realize, hey, granddad's pretty special. Um, that probably uh, started occurring to me when I got into school. I was born during his first term of office. so. Um, you know, I got into school later on and uh, people started treating me a little differently and it was strange because you would think that it would be like, wow, this is really cool, but it was, it was more of a, um, well, let me put it this way. When I had my son and I put him in daycare, I went, to, I went to pick him up and they said, Meryl's mother is here. And I thought, oh my gosh, all my life I've been granddad's granddaughter, daddy's daughter, David's sister, and now I'm Meryl's mother, when am I me? You know, so that's kind of that's kind of what started happening. Um, but uh, I, I saw it. I just I never introduced myself by my last name. I, I was always just Mary. Well, you, you're fun and you're here in Hayes doing a project for really the Eisenhower Museum. Yes. And that's really neat because you know, people that have not seen that really should because it's a wonderful part of our history, especially the Kansas history. And how often do you make it back to Abilene? Oh, as often as I can. Um, I, I've been accused of genetic memory before, <laughs> but I, I get uh, my batteries recharged every time I go to Abilene. I just love it. Now, do you remember the home that's on the, the, the museum grounds itself? Do you remember yes. all of that? Uh, well, um, not from growing up, but uh, the first time I was out was actually when Granddad died mm -hmm. in 1969. Um, but, and then I guess again, uh, when my grandmother died um, in 79, and then after that, I've been coming out several times a year, but now that I live in the Midwest myself, I, I go out as often as I can. One of the things that, that you're doing right now is, is called People to People International that deals with, one again, one of the things that your grandfather started. Right. And uh, tell me about that. Well, I look at it like, um, I, I kind of call it my, my you know, era in my life of, of discovery because um, I discovered a grandfather I didn't know by the original writings and, and his whole philosophy about the people to people um, thing. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, it was interesting because uh, I have sometimes used um, old contacts to get things done for people to people in other countries. And so a lot of um, the next generation's friendships kind of um, encircled, you know, friendships that my grandfather had. So it's kind of, you know, he was a, a, still a part of my life, but a very different part, obviously. And uh, I learned a lot about him, and I learned a lot about uh, the war, and particularly um, uh, the Holocaust and, and things like that, because that was the inspiration for people to people. He felt like there was a better way to achieve your goals than, than that. Well, in my yeah. case, you know, so much of the memory has to do with what I've read in history books. You yes. know, D-Day invasion, he was involved with the planning of that, which is really the turning of the war. So a lot of the things being his status in the military, 
was military related, but the people to people program was really a whole different side of that, of mm -hmm. getting people together and kids together. What have you done so far on that? Because I know you followed up with some really great projects. Well, I think my, uh, my, my pet project is uh, what I called, uh, I've named Peace Camp. And it's where you get kids from all over the world in a safe place outside of the U.S. where they can talk about current events and how they're affecting them. And, uh, but it, it's kind of interesting because what you learn is that, um, you know, our goals are all pretty much the same. And the way I explain it to, like, students that I talk to, is I say, you know, you, you might have um, someone from all four corners of the earth. You might have somebody from Asia, somebody from Africa, somebody from Europe, somebody from South America, somebody from the United States, and they're all gonna dress differently. They're gonna eat differently. They're gonna have different accents even within the countries and all that. But if you took their hearts out of their chest, you wouldn't be able to tell them apart. Have you learned some interesting things from these people around oh, the world? Oh, yes. <laughs> it, it was kind of funny. Um, when McCain was running against Obama. Oh, yeah? Um, you know, we're non-political, so uh, I, I never, express how I feel about uh, any of it. But um, uh, when I was going like into the Middle East and each and places like that, they were going, surely you're going to vote for Obama, right? You know, mm -hmm. and then um, I went to Cambodia uh, because we were working on the eradication of um, landmines. And when I was going through customs, this, this, he looked like he was about 18, 19 years old. And he looks at my passport and he looks at me and he says, American? And I said, yes. And he said, vote McCain? <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of interesting to see, you know, how we're perceived around the world. You know, you've had some really amazing travel as a part of this. Does the connection and the Eisenhower name get you in some places that you would never get before and maybe get you in some situations that are exciting? It's, it's been a little different uh, from time to time. Uh, it, it was kind of funny, one time in, in Egypt, um, uh, I was on Good Morning Egypt, which is a real show, and it, it goes mm -hmm. to about four countries, and it was a great opportunity to spread the word about people to people. And afterwards, I went to the Cairo Museum, and I don't exactly blend in Egypt. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, so this this group of um, young ladies, oh, I'd say they were, they were probably between 10 and 12, and they, they were all veiled, and they had their burqas and uh, that kind of thing. But they came up to me, and they said, are you Miss Eisenhower? And I said, yes. And... Um, they kind of got like in front of me in a semicircle and they said, um, Mrs. Mubarak, who I adore, I might add, mm -hmm. um, said that if, if you touch a person in the right way, it's okay. May we touch you? And I knew that, you know, like my hair is, everything's different, right? Mm -hmm. And so I said, well, sure. But then, you know, I got the whole space thing. So I started backing up and I ended up against the wall. And the guard looked at me and said, Miss Eisenhower, do you need help? And I said, nope. <laughs> <laughs> but it was really, it was kind of interesting. It was fun to, for that to happen. And it's something unusual for them too. I mean, exactly. to be able to have well, that situation Well, it was for both of us, happen. yeah. What about leaders from other parts of the world? Have you had a chance to meet some of them? They may not be the same ones that your grandfather met, but they may be in the same I've met some of the offspring, yeah. and, and um, it's, it's, it's fun because uh, Granddad was very close to some of them, and um, so kind of the admiration has, has come down through the generations, and uh, uh, Jordan's a good example. Uh, the, the King Hussein of Jordan was a very good friend of my grandfather's. I think they had kind of a father-son mm -hmm. uh, type of relationship, and King Abdullah has met with us, and he also, um, was the patron, um, well, Prince Ghazi was his en envoy for it, mm -hmm. um, of Peace Camp and made that just an extremely memorable uh, Peace Camp. And, and they were so supportive and uh, Egypt has done the same thing. Uh, Mrs. Mubarak got involved in the Peace Camps there and she helped us lead Peace Walks through Sharm El Sheikh. And um, that, that was where I saw our Palestinian students and our Israeli students holding hands, walking along the Red Sea there was peace in the Middle East that day, anyway. What a, what, a, what a great story, because that tells a different side of maybe what we see in some of the media right now. Totally. A couple more I questions. I was the and antidote to CNN. Yeah, yeah, we'd like <laughs> to see that. You know, one of the things I know before we take a break here, I want to come back. You mentioned landmines and cleaning landmines. How does that fit into people to people? Well, it builds bridges. And, and when you work Did you clean landmines yourself? I have blown up some landmines, but I have not, I don't physically remove She's them, no. Good. No, yeah. we, we, uh, we teach, um, or we worked with Halo Trust um, and teach the, the locals 
how to actually remove the landmines. But they, they let me uh, pull the plug on a couple of them and detonate them. <laughs> and it, felt so good. it was the boom for humanity, right? It was. Yeah. Good. You know, another thing that started, and, and this has to me been a, just a great um, uh, institution of, of our country, was NASA. Yes. And, and your grandfather was a part of getting that started. Totally. Totally. And what that led to and, and what it's still it. He loved the whole thing. You know, the whole, he loved gadgets and computers and space and uh, things like that. I mean, he was, he was kind of a sci-fi person. And uh, he, uh, you know, it, it, it was kind of interesting because uh, he was almost prophetic in some of the stuff he said about it because it became so awesome to him that he started realizing its potential, too. And he worried about it. You know, he worried that the wars would become more sophisticated and, gee, has that happened? <laughs> you know, I think it has. Um, I think the one time I really thought about him and some of his fears uh, was when they started referring to the war as a, a surgical war. And mm -hmm. I thought, ooh, you know, how can you, how can you dissect it like that? Mm -hmm. it, it's, still, it's still bombs and it's still destroying buildings and people and lives and that kind of thing. So it's, it's still the same thing. And it just made me appreciate what he used to worry about. But he loved it. I mean, he loved high tech. Well, one of the things I've, I've noticed talking to you here before coming to the program was that, you know, you have a real passion for telling his story and really taking his story and making it move forward, not only into 2016 where it is today, but moving it forward because of those amazing things he did. Well, um, like I said a minute ago, he was almost prophetic in some of the stuff that uh, he said in some of his um, uh, uh, philosophies and if you if you actually if you read um, the very last paragraph of his farewell address is the same one where he warns about um, the military industrial complex but that last paragraph completely embodies who he is or was and what he wanted for the world and it you know I, I the first time I read it was actually after I went to work for people to people and I now work it into every speech I can very cool. Yeah. Mary Jean we're gonna take a quick break Mary Jean Eisenhower is our guest here on the forum program we'll be back after this from Hayes Med. Hayes Med is your first and best choice for healthcare. They're the only facility providing tertiary level services in this region. With more than 70 physicians and 26 specialties, ranging from heart, orthopedic, spine care, cancer, obstetrics and gynecology, wound care, rehabilitation and surgery, including the Da Vinci robotic surgery, Hayes Med is your comprehensive health provider for people throughout Western Kansas. Hayes Med helping people be healthy. Welcome back to the second half of our forum program here on Eagle Community Television. Our guest is Mary Jean Eisenhower. If you have any questions, comments, and really some thoughts about future programs, send them to me. I don't think they're gonna get better than this one, but send them to me at gary.shorman at eaglecom.net. I'd like to hear from you. Again, our guest is Mary Jean Eisenhower, the granddaughter of former President Dwight David Eisenhower of Abilene. During the break, we were talking about the history because you and I were born about the same time, and, and you look at that, I learned about Dwight Eisenhower through my parents and then what you read in history. The Eisenhower Museum has all of what went on, and that's part mm. of what you're talking about today here as well. How, how do you preserve that, but more importantly than that, how do you continue to tell the story of what happened during those two terms as Dwight Eisenhower's presidency? Um, how does the muse museum, well, um, I think what's very important, uh, and you know, his, his love of technology that I was mentioning um, uh, is kind of a good thing in, in this case. You know, they have, uh, they'll have a lot of interactive things so people can actually learn about some of the things that they're interested in. And it's amazing um, how in tune with the future he was with his writings from the past. You know, mm -hmm. it, it, it um, uh, you know, he was afraid, for example, um, that he, he felt like we needed to remember the Holocaust because he said someday somebody's going to say it never happened. Mm -hmm. And he thought it was our responsibility to make sure that that, car that story carried through. And of course, through my work, um, I, I totally agree with him, you know, and um, uh, I think I have a little bit of an advantage uh, in that, you know, I, I knew him as a granddaughter. So when I see the things that had nothing to do with me, but make perfect sense, I, I understand where they came from. And um, I think it's important too, um, to preserve some of the integrities. Uh, you know, it, he, um, he, was, he had so much integrity and 
after the elections, he was, he was an American. He wasn't a Democrat or a Republican. He was the president and he was trying to get things done. You know, and I think that's one of the reasons he could work so well with all the, the generals in uh, World War II. Mm -hmm. And, and um, with the, you know, he had a completely Democratic uh, Congress when he first went in and he still got a lot done. They didn't get gridlocked like they are now and uh, things well, like that. He was special and you see that and you, and you look at the two terms, you know, there's really a lot of progress made, some great institutions like NASA, you know, the highway system was put into place. You look at even some of the beginnings of the internet were starting to form there that's turned into just, you can see what happens now. So those things, and you take a look at it, like, wow, there was a lot happened from a gentleman that grew up in Abilene, Kansas, and that's what makes it so cool. Yeah, between 1956 and 58, those were, those were some big times. Um, but it was interesting because, um, like with the, uh, the highway system, and I love to talk to kids about that because they, they get it. I mm -hmm. mean, they understand what I'm talking about. But he had gone on a convoy when he was, um, I guess it was right after World War I. Um, he was charged with seeing how fast he could get across the United States and back. Mm -hmm. And it took him like 90 days. And um, so that stayed a concern for him. And when he got to Europe, you know, during the war, he saw the Audubons and he went, wow, that, you know, this is, this is what we need to do. And then when he became president, he made it reality, but. Um, That's one of those things we kind of take for granted now. You just go out and get on the interstate and drive somewhere. It used to be it, a defense system, believe it or not. Yeah, because you could yeah. find certain areas where you could actually land planes out there if you needed That's right. to, if I understand the story right. So uh, Every five miles, there's a, a straight mile that can serve as a runway. As a pilot, I've, I've never had to use one of those, but I have <laughs> thought about it a few times. Just so. pulling at the gas station, you know. <laughs> Mary Jean, what, what do you want to do next? Because you've had a chance and, and follow up. You spent a little time overseas, mm -hmm. your dad. Your father was an ambassador, if I understand it right. Yes. So you yes. spent some time overseas. You've had to do, got a chance to do a lot of traveling. What's next for you? They'll probably have to carry me out feet first. Okay. Because I'm that passionate about it. But if there, if if I gave up everything else and there was only one thing left I could do, it'd be my grandson. Take care of him. Yeah. <laughs> Would you tell him your stories that you've been telling today about his great, or his, it would be his great great grandfather? Uh, I, I think I'd almost have to because he looks so much like him, it's incredible. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. So that'll be fun to do. How old is he? Two. Oh, well, grandkids are a lot of fun, and you'll find and that's a lot of things. Of course, brilliant and perfect. <laughs> like they all are. <laughs> yeah. People to people, uh, is that continuing on right now? Because I know you're yes. still working with that. And uh, what are they doing today? Well, uh, right now we're doing mainly a student exchange, uh, and we are going to kick the Peace Camp program back up. Um, and a couple of other things that uh, I, I took a two year leave of absence and mm -hmm. some of the things, you know, kind of were not done during that absence, but um, we're, we're gonna uh, kick them back up and keep going. Where do people find out about that? Oh, um, our website is uh, ptpi.org. Mm -hmm. And so people can go there, find out how to participate if oh, they want to sure. do that yes. as well? Yes, And one thing that I'm doing that I'm really excited about in December, um, for the first time since the Arab Spring, I'm going back to Egypt. I had been 29 times before, so I'll, I'll have my 30th in, in December. So I'm really excited. We'll appreciate all the work you do when you talk about getting kids together and share a peaceful story, peaceful times together. Hopefully that helps down the road to have everybody understand more and more about each other. Well, I know just the example of what I was saying about um, the, the peace camps. Uh, the first one was in 2003. Those students are all still in touch. They have kids of their own, and some of them started their own people-to-people -people chapters and um, you know, school programs and things like that. So it's, it, it definitely has an impact, and it definitely um, has a long-term effect on people. Mary Jean, thanks so much for being This has been a <laughs> delightful you. program. Thanks for joining us here Thank today. You and thanks so much. for what you're doing with, for the museum as well and the history yes. of your grandfather, Dwight Eisenhower. Well, he, he would treasure the museum if he could see it now. So, Great. Yeah. Thanks for watching our forum program. Again, our guest has been Mary Jean Eisenhower, the granddaughter of former President Dwight David Eisenhower. The forum brought to you by Hayes Med and by Eagle Communications, our community connected. It's a beautiful day in our super high speed internet, great customer service neighborhood. Like you, this is where we live. In fact, our company is employee owned, so it's our goal to improve the quality of life for everyone in our community by delivering faster, more reliable internet clearer, more feature-laden phone service, quality TV channels, 
all with the level of customer service you'd expect from people who are your neighbors. Eagle Communications, our community connected.